Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Open to Export webinar about export opportunities and challenges for UK businesses in the Southeast Asia region. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I am the Senior Content Editor at the Institute of Export and International Trade. Next, please. Open to Export is a free online service helping small businesses get ready to sell overseas to our step by step articles and guides, regular webinars our export action plan tool and our quarterly competitions. You can find out more information about all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Next, please. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's professional membership body for traders, endorsed by the World Trade Organization and the International Chamber of Commerce as a small business champion. We offer a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. Next, please. We will be running a live Q&A later in the session, and you can ask questions at any point using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. The general principle here is that we'll only ask questions that are relevant to the broader audience, so we won't be able to go into company specifics as such, but if you do have specific questions, we can refer you to our technical helpline afterwards. Next, please. We're delighted to have two fantastic speakers today. Brooke Horowitz, uh, the CEO of IBLF Global and the man behind the Institute's risk management training courses will be on later on. But to kick things off, we first have Paul, no Paul North from the UK ASEAN Business Council. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, William, and good afternoon to everybody. My name is Paul North, as uh, William's mentioned, and I'm with the UK ASEAN Business Council. Next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about ASEAN as, as a whole. And what is ASEAN? Well, it's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It was established in 1967 to really accelerate cultural development economic growth and social progress throughout the region. And since 1967, it's grown to include 10 countries, those countries being Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, all very diverse countries economically, culturally, and politically, from the high-tech market of Singapore to the recently opened up market of Myanmar. ASEAN is strategically placed as a geographical hub between China and India. It has a young, dynamic consumer market with a population of over 630 million and with an average age of just 26 years of age. It is the sixth largest economy in the world, and it will be the fourth largest economy within the next 10 years behind the US, China, and the EU. ASEAN is similar in part to other single markets with the slow and steady integration of economies, but with no common currency or free movement of people. To give you a flair of what the, the, um, the region is spending in the way of infrastructure projects, it's around 45 billion a year, and that will continue for the next 10 years. Next slide, please. So we mentioned the growing, diverse, the multilingual talent pool of over 630 million, and this has created really a huge middle-class consumer base, where GDP per capita has seen 70% growth from 2007 to present day, to about 3,000 pounds sterling per capita head. There's massive infrastructure investment across the region, ranging from BRI, projects to individual country plan. Every country has a X4.0 plan. And there's a huge, a huge amount of foreign direct investment from China, Japan, Korea, and uh, lots of other um, organizations there. Long term, ASEAN's growth will continue to be shaped by the economic policies, by the regional trade policies, including the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP as it's called, investment incentives, uh, along with infrastructure financing capacities 
and capabilities. Next slide, please. So where do we fit in UK ASEAN Business Council? Um, we are the leading UK-based organisation promoting trade and investment between the UK and ASEAN's dynamic markets. We were created out of the then UK Trade and Investment, which is now the Department for International Trade, 2011 strategy, Britain Open for Business. And the UK ABC was launched by the then Business Secretary, Vince Cable in November of that year, along with a couple of organizations which you may also be familiar with, which were also launched to, to promote uh, business across uh, Asian regions, was the UK India Business Council and also the Britain Business China Council. We help UK companies of all sizes build new contacts provide market insights and raise the awareness of the vast commercial developments in what is undoubtedly one of the most exciting, vibrant and fastest growing regions in the world. We also bring ASEAN to the UK through a sustained calendar of country briefings, targeted meetings, one-to-one -one clinics and other promotional events. And in addition, we sign post practical advice and guidance on how to do business in ASEAN and could provide access to a considerable network of useful contacts. Next slide, please. So we are working closely with the UK and ASEAN governments, key partner organizations, including the British Chambers of Commerce in ASEAN, influential corporates, experienced SMEs, market experts, and professional service providers. We have created an extensive UK ASEAN business network that links UK innovation and expertise with ASEAN's commercial development. We should also not forget our DIT colleagues and other governmental departments. So we work extremely closely with the Department for International Trade, UK Export Finance, the Intellectual Property Office and the Foreign and Commonwealth Offices. It might be worth adding that um, uh, albeit we were a governmental body and formed by the government back in 2011, we have now for the past six years been a standalone business council organisation, but we're still receiving a small grant from the Department of International Trade to deliver exporting services. Next slide, please. So this is just showing the logos of, of many of our partners. Uh, just to say again that we have this extensive partner network representing UK and ASEAN governments and the large corporates. The top line there are partners of UK ASEAN Business Council. Uh, as you can see, we've got some relatively big hitters there that are not only big here in the UK, but extreme, extremely large in ASEAN. And these are organizations across different sectors that we can certainly hook uh, SMEs into our, who are looking to uh, also push forward in the ASEAN markets. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier a couple of other organisations that were formed at the same time as UK ASEAN Business Council, so we do look at that uh, bigger picture. So we're working closely with UK Indian Business Council. In fact, we share offices with them in London and the China Britain Business Council uh, uh, as well. And we get a lot of referrals backwards and forwards from organizations that are in India or China and wanting to look then further afield into new international markets into ASEAN. Just out of interest, because this is where the business is, this is where you should be. Um, world population of 7.6 billion, four and a half billion of those live and work within that circle. That reason alone should be sufficient to, to want to get involved in ASEAN. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier the British Chambers of Commerce in ASEAN. Uh, they are our in-country partners delivering services to uh, organizations to exporters who are looking to get into the marketplace. They are here uh, twice a year 
um, as, a, as, as a group, which is called Britain in Southeast Asia. They were here in, in April, May of this year, and will be here again in October and be part of our UK ABC Roadshow, which I'll talk a little bit further down in the slides. Um, they are local staff. We have sector specialists there with several years of, of market experience. And they're not only working in networking events, premier events, and, and, and along there with the government. They all have sector committees there promoting trade and investment between their particular countries and the UK. But they're also delivering market entry services for UK companies. They are all members of the British Chambers of Commerce here in the UK, and they all accredited by the British Chambers of Commerce. So they are accredited to deliver services um, as good as the services which are delivered here by the British Chambers of Commerce across the UK. I know I've mentioned there the short video of the Indonesian Chamber to follow. I'm not be showing that today, but that is available and just gives you a flair for, for how these um, Chambers of Commerce are operating. Next slide, please. So just uh, three or four slides here, some country snapshots um, uh, in uh, alphabetical order more than anything, rather than uh, ease of doing business there. We'll start off with Cambodia, which is a developing market economy with a very open investment policy and real opportunities for creative entrepreneurs and dynamic businesses. It has experienced a 7% annual growth rate for the last five years. Cambodia is a unique country, provides a number of opportunities across different sectors for both UK companies already operating in Southeast Asia and those new to the region. Indonesia, that's a country of big numbers and big opportunities. It's 240 million inhabitants. It's the world's fourth largest, sorry, the fourth most populous country and the largest in Southeast Asia. The largest economy sector in Indonesia is manufacturing and processing, which contributes around 24% of the country's GDP. The major industries in this sector include food and beverages, machinery and transportation, chemicals, textiles, agriculture, including forestry, plantation, farming and fishery, and the hospitality. Next slide, please. Malaysia, um, again, has decades of strong industrial growth and political stability. And this has made Malaysia one of Southeast Asia's most vibrant and successful economies. It offers a low cost business environment, high skill levels, and relatively low salary costs for qualified professionals and executives. Malaysia is also a prime tourist destination, offering unique traditional attractions amidst the modern day development. Myanmar. Uh, this country has recently re-emerged onto the global stage after 50 years of isolation, and we're hearing it probably at the moment for all the wrong reasons. But it is a country that has nothing and needs everything. It's a country of over 50 million people, uh, strategically located between China and India with plentiful of natural resources. It has seen um, in the last couple of years economic growth of about eight and a half percent, making it the fastest growing country in Southeast Asia. Myanmar is still developing vast resources, outdated infrastructure. The opportunities are huge, but there are also a range of obstacles. Next slide, please. Well, the Philippines, this has been forecasted uh, that it could be and become the world's 16th largest economy by 2050, making it an attractive and exciting prospect for UK businesses. Philippines is now rated, ranked 52nd in the World Economic Forum's Global Connect Competitiveness Report. My colleague who follows that will probably um, have something which might be a little bit more up to date on that, but it has improved by 32 places in the last four years. 
Today, the Philippines is currently Southeast Asia's fastest growing country and has taken over the growth leadership role among ASEAN member countries. Opportunities across all sectors. They themselves, Philippines, are having a 10 year build, build, build program, uh, mainly in infrastructure projects. It's expansion of the main international airport, the addition of three other additional international airports and huge road structures to to really pull together a lot of the remote islands that are within the Philippines. Singapore. Singapore it increasingly serves as a hub for Southeast Asia across an extensive range of financial and business services. Service sector makes up over two thirds of the GDP share dominated by financial and business services. Singapore is the fourth global financial center after London, New York, and Hong Kong, and the second largest wealth management center after, Singapore, after Switzerland. Uh, Singapore is of doing business number two in the world, knocked off the top spot last year by New Zealand. But there are a huge number of opportunities still in, sector in Singapore as uh, across all sectors. Next slide, please. Thailand offers an exciting business opportunity to companies prepared to take a serious interest in this dynamic market. It is the second largest economy in ASEAN, accounting for around 70%, 1717, of the ASEAN GDP. Thailand's economy is in the top three in ASEAN in terms of size and volume of international trade and it's therefore well positioned as the region moves towards economic integration and a single free trade area. Zero tariffs between the top five members, including uh, Malaysia, were implemented back in January 2010. Vietnam, again, is one of the fastest, most vibrant economies in all of Asia. You, you will continue to hear this from us and from other uh, organizations that this is the fastest growing part of the world at this moment in time. Over the past 10 years, economic growth has been second only to China and GDP has been doubling every 10 years since 1986. It's forecast to be one of the top 10 fastest growing economies in the next few decades. You may have noticed on several of these slides going through that there is an ease of doing business ranking, which is these are doing business ranking by the World Bank. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, the ease of doing business in many of these countries is a lot easier than doing business in China, India, and some of the Gulf states. Next slide, please. So I would encourage you all to have a look uh, on our website, ukabc.org.uk, where we've got a huge amount of, of, of information on doing business in ASEAN. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of information on, on ASEAN itself and individual countries. We've got a lot of publications up there which are all downloadable about doing business in that part of the world. We also have all the our upcoming events, not just our events, but all events that are happening around ASEAN uh, themed here in the UK, but also all the upcoming events that are happening in ASEAN. And I think that's particularly good when, when companies are looking to get into the marketplace, looking to visit uh, these countries, and then they can sort of uh, base their visit around a summit, a conference, or an expo that's happening within there. So everything is, is up there in the way of uh, events uh, across ASEAN. We have a lot of uh, support there. There's a lot of export opportunities. So live export opportunities that you can click on, look at what that opportunity is. You can select by sector, you can select by country, and make yourself um, put yourself in front of potential uh, partners that are looking for UK companies. Next slide. So we also attached to our main site, we have some microsites 
uh, this is uh, one of his life at the moment. It's about education opportunities in ASEAN. Uh, again, a lot of information, a lot of resources out there, business opportunities that are available, everything you want to know about the education sector. We also have one up there on tech, and uh, to follow will be a food and drink uh, infrastructure and healthcare uh, microsite, which, is, which will be up and running very, very shortly. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation about uh, a UK-wide roadshow program, which is kicking off in October, 7th to the 11th. We're doing five cities in uh, one week. Um, and this is all about building up the awareness and the opportunities in ASEAN. We will be joined by our in-country market experts, the British Chambers of Commerce in ASEAN, will be representing eight of those countries. Lau and Brunei, unfortunately, will not be there on this occasion. And uh, these are the executive, executive directors of the chambers. You'll have the opportunity to be put in front of them for 20 minute, 30 minute one-to-one -one meetings, and they will be able to tell you whether your product or service uh, has those opportunities in, in those countries. So that's tied up with a practical uh, morning of workshops about advice on doing business in ASEAN. On this particular roadshow, we also will have a delegation from uh, one of Myanmar's special economic zones. Uh, they are an organization that are looking for mid-tech manufacturing companies to have a base, a manufacturing base in Myanmar uh, to serve the rest of the region. So it's great to um, great to have them uh, on board. So that's our first one, which will be kicking off in, in, in October, but we will also be in the east of England, we will be in the southeast, we will be in Northern Ireland, we will be in Scotland, we will be in uh, Wales, all before the end of March 2020. Next slide, please. So this is us, we're a, a small team, but uh, very, very effective. And uh, with the exception of myself, the rest of the team are based down there in London, in Millbank Tower. Uh, if you are unaware where that is, we're just down from the Houses of Parliament, as you can see there. And we have the Tate Gallery on the left-hand side, and we're on the north bank there of, uh, of the river. Next slide, please. So well, this is me, uh, my contact details, and uh, I'm more than happy to um, uh, have a chat with, um, with companies who are interested in uh, entering the dynamic markets of ASEAN. And uh, that's more or less my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. And um, a yeah, really good overview of the ASEAN region and the opportunities that are out there. And now to discuss some of the um, business culture and can risks in, in terms of those markets. We have Brooke. Over to you, Brooke. Thank you very much. And thank you, Paul. That was a, a lovely presentation of all the opportunities there. Um, I should say that um, my role in this is not to put a downer on anything that Paul has said. But um, the thing, the sort of issues that interest me as a consultant, um, and I think should interest you as companies, are balancing the risk and opportunity. And um, uh, I specialize on compliance systems, on promoting business integrity in emerging markets. That's what I do for my company, for, for my uh, not-for-profit company, IBLF Global. Um, and then for my uh, commercial company, Culture of Business, I work with companies to uh, really design uh, simple, systems for medium-sized companies going into these difficult markets in emerging and developing markets for the first time, uh, understanding the risks and uh, building simple systems that can at least uh, prevent uh, things from going wrong. And if things do go wrong, then you can detect them in time and uh, respond in the appropriate way. Um, I'm also very interested from my you know, rather 
long international experience working in um, uh, Russia for many years and Eastern Europe, um, and, and also now uh, increasingly in uh, the ASEAN countries. I'm very interested in the cultural differences. I mean, even if you take out all the difficult areas like um, you know, currency and uh, customs and trade barriers and all those sort of things, you're still left with huge cultural differences. And what I think is very clear from what Paul was saying was that these 10 countries in ASEAN are very different from each other and they're very different from the UK. And therefore, um, it's certainly not for the faint-hearted. All I'm saying is that you go in with your eyes wide open into these markets and understanding the cultural sensitivities and differences, you can actually bridge the gap and, um, and make sure that you have a very successful uh, business relationship. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I, uh, um, Paul mentioned the <clears throat> ease of do, excuse me, uh, the ease of doing business uh, index, which is a World Bank comparison, um, and it's actually very informative, and you can drill down into the different countries and find out what are the obstacles and the opportunities in um, 14 different uh, areas. Uh, such as getting construction passes and permits or um, raising uh, or, or um, getting credit. Uh, and I think that is very interesting from the point of view of uh, domestic companies in these markets, as well as international uh, investors and uh, exporters like yourselves. Uh, another index which I like is the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index. And, um, you know, what this shows um, just on, on the map is that these markets are, are not exactly uh, the worst of all uh, the countries, um, but um, you know some of them are. I mean, Singapore and Malaysia are right up there in the top uh, ten or top top twenty countries of the world. Uh, but you've also got um, many other countries like uh, Laos or uh, Myanmar, which are really right at the bottom so you know that those cultural differences the history the recent history you're aware of Myanmar coming out of these years of dictatorship but <laughs> there has been um, quite a lot of authoritarianism in many of these other countries these have all um, had a huge impact on how business is conducted today in these countries next slide please um, getting into more specifics, uh, you can see uh, that um, uh, th this is the ranking of the countries in the Global Competitiveness Report of 2017 to 18. And right up there amongst you know, the top countries of the world is Singapore. But then you know, many of these other countries uh, are really not very highly placed. Uh, yes, it's true that Thailand's come up recently. Indonesia, um, you know, for one of the biggest countries in the world, is is really ranking quite well now at 36. Um, Vietnam is up and coming. It's a growth market. It's really making efforts to open its uh, its economy to uh, foreign business, and they're acutely aware of this. And by the way, there's a, a many of these countries, but especially Vietnam, see China as the big competitor, uh, although. I don't think anybody feels uh, able to compete with China nowadays. Still, um, Vietnam has got this sort of, you know, uh, slightly um, smaller brother, big brother relationship with China, which makes it want to do even better and to open up even more. Uh, but, you know, you can see Cambodia and Laos right at the bottom. These are important markets, but uh, they are really uh, quite challenging uh, in the view of the, uh, the the Western business people who have been surveyed for this report. And Myanmar doesn't even appear on the list. Next slide. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the same uh, global competitive index uh, uh, positioning here. Um, and you know, compared to the average, unfortunately, the ASEAN countries are, are not 
uh, above average. They are below average, except for Singapore, I suppose. Um, I mean, you can count, uh, well, China, Taiwan, and so on, and not ASEAN. Malaysia is. So Malaysia and Singapore are up in the, in the top half, uh, above average. But the others, you know, it is a challenge, and you need to appreciate that when you're going into these markets. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is from the Global uh, Competitiveness Report, and you can see uh, the uh, um, uh, the contrast of the uh, the global average is the big black line here, and the, this is for ASEAN countries, and uh, the high income ASEAN countries uh, fare better than the global average, but the uh, the low income countries, and that would be countries like uh, Vietnam, Myanmar. Uh, in fact, all, most of them, Philippines, Indonesia, all of these are low to mid income, according to the World Bank structures. And you can see that there's some, the, the, the bigger the distance to the black line, um, the uh, more serious the challenges. And you can see problems around transparency and property rights, uh, um, public sector performance, not very strong. Um, so these are the sort of areas that are challenging for uh, companies going into these markets. Next slide, please. And I find these next charts amongst the most interesting from the World Economic Forum. Uh, they surveyed their, the companies, uh, the multinational companies that are working in these markets, and they have come across, uh, they, they look at each country and they ask what are the biggest challenges and the most problematic factors. And here, Indonesia, I'm doing these in order of the size of the countries by population. Uh, Indonesia, corruption, inefficient government, bureaucracy, access to financing. You'll find these things repeat themselves from country to country. They are um, interlinked. There's no doubt that the high level of corruption in Indonesia is absolutely linked to the huge and heavy government bureaucracy that is there. I mean, there are literally millions of civil servants uh, right across the board. And yeah, this is the, the, the big challenge for many of these countries is how to reduce the red tape, how to free up the markets so as to uh, allow uh, their people to, to blossom and for, for investment to flow in. And um, even if the countries are doing so much better, as Paul has um, explained, you have to understand that this is the legacy from which they are emerging today. Next slide. Uh, so Philippines, um, again, you can, I mean, corruption is significantly lower down, um, but access to financing, foreign currency regulations, inefficient government bureaucracy, you know, plus we know that there is a, um, a, a government leader who's quite, um, quite difficult. Mind you, we have our fair share in the Western world of those, um, so I won't make any <laughs> serious comments about it. But, um, you know, Philippines are uh, still uh, challenging. Uh, next, <clears throat> Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam's a country that I spend quite a lot of time in nowadays. Over the last three years, I've been doing some British government uh, projects to uh, address some of these issues around corruption and business integrity and leveling the playing field for British companies. And um, I, I find it a most attractive and interesting market to work in. I find the people absolutely wonderful. Um, but when you go to Hanoi or to Ho Chi Minh City, or you go to other places, you do see this, uh, first of all, you, know, you just wonder about the poverty. Um, you, you, you can see the, uh, the, the, these little shops and um, kind of restaurants that where, where basically people are eating out on the street. And, you know, it's not like a picnic. <laughs> it really is inner city um, degradation, which is not fully being addressed by the authorities. And, I, you know, it, it, for people going there to a country like Vietnam for the first time, it is a little bit shocking. Um, however, you know, you can see that the authorities are trying to really um, make an effort to, to change this. But at the center of it, again and again, is the issue of corruption. And when 
multinational companies or British medium-sized companies come into a country like Vietnam, you know, it, it is just a question of time before you get asked to make some kinds of payment. Um, next. <clears throat> and Thailand, again, uh, government instability and coups are seen as a big problem. It's a bit more stable now, but uh, it's got a bad history. Um, pol policy instability, inefficient government bureaucracy, same sort of things. Keep going. Next slide. So uh, I just want to focus a few minutes on uh, the topic that is my area of specialization, which is the, um, the corruption area and how you can avoid corruption. So I just touched upon it a few minutes ago. Why do companies pay bribes? It's to eliminate or bypass the bureaucracy or bypass the law. Uh, yeah, a lot of this stuff is so small, it may be a facilitating payment, as it's called in the business, which is, you know, customs official is trying to prevent something for, uh, from entering the country. He's making it difficult that your goods are stuck in a warehouse somewhere. And it turns out that you're paying thousands of pounds or dollars or dong <laughs> or baht. Uh, you're paying thousands in in um, in in in, um, in storage costs because you can't get the stuff through. What do you do? You get a, get asked to pay some kind of small payment, which is a fraction of the cost of uh, how much you're going to be paying in warehousing fees. Uh, what do you do? You you probably pay it. And unfortunately for us. This has become illegal under the UK Bribery Act. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, the, the, the risk areas that you, you will come across in any of these markets, it's going to be your uh, third party agents and distributors. So you, know, you may not be asked for a bribe and, you know, you may not actually do the business yourself. You are hiring your uh, the, the services of a local agent or your distributor. They're, acting under your name with your logo and with your brand and they are having to operate according to these uh, local standards of business and uh, you know, it is illegal um, you know there's no other way of saying it uh, the UK bribery act which I'll come to is absolutely clear about this so you know, there's lots of high risk areas around you know gifts and entertainment, again, cultural issues um, in most of the Asian countries, I think in all of them, uh, entertaining people, taking them out for a drink, taking them out for an expensive dinner, inviting them to Disney World in Florida, all of that is absolutely part of doing business. And unfortunately for us, <laughs> this is no longer uh, possible. I mean, you can take people out for dinner or for lunch. You can um, you can make these kind of sort of ex gratia <laughs> contributions, but uh, you have to be careful because if you are deemed to be giving some uh, incentive for people's decision making in your favour and therefore taking anti-competitive uh, um, steps that will undermine the competition, um, then you, know, you are essentially uh, contravening the UK Bribery Act. And there's not, it's not just the UK Bribery Act you need to be careful about. There's the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States and, and local lo legislation as well, which in most of these countries is, uh, has, has um, appeared in the last few years. So again, I, I'm not saying that you can't take people out for lunch or for dinner. You can be generous. That's what's expected in these cultures. But you need to record it. You need to be make sure that your employees are fully aware of uh, the, the, the UK legislation and local legislation. And you just keep it in proportion with what you're trying to achieve. Um, let's have the next slide. Uh, so the UK Bribery Act, key piece of legislation from 2010, uh, there haven't been a lot of uh, prosecutions and the prosecutions that there have been have usually ended in some kind of deal between the government, it's the serious fraud office and, and the companies involved. And we're talking about mega companies, but it is setting a new trend and therefore it's just a matter of time 
before medium-sized companies will get hit on, uh, on, on something that they've done wrong. And unfortunately, some of this is just inadvertently you know, not really understanding the implications of the law. Um, things like the uh, extraterritorial application of the law is a pretty new concept under British law. It means that your um, agent or distributor, let's say in Philippines, is a local company and is giving a bribe to a local public official to win a contract, essentially on your behalf. You may not even know about it, but you will be liable. And you know, if, if your competition gets wind of it and reports it to the authorities, then you will be liable. So this is where this great big clash of culture between the way things are done traditionally in these countries and the, uh, the, the kind of UK traditions of not behaving according to those rules. And then plus the legislative sort of baggage that we come into these countries with, that's where the challenge is. Is, it, um, are, is one able to operate in these countries even with all of this going on? Absolutely, yes. It's just understanding clearly and carefully what the position is and what you're doing and go in, as I said, with your eyes open. Next slide. Well, if you want more information about the UK Bribery Act, it's right there. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if you can click that. Can you click it? Uh, well, <clears throat> no, don't, don't, don't go in, don't click it now, but um, you, you can get, uh, this is information about the Bribery Act. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you can just scroll down a little bit. It, I mean, the, the, the quick start guide, which is just up there underneath the guidance, that is a good one to start off with. It's only 10 pages long and you can read through it in five minutes and get a picture for it and then drill down a little bit more into the guidance. I'm not sure that you actually have to read the whole law, but you need to know about it. Um, if you want to look at the legislation on this stuff in the different countries, you can go to that uh, unodc.org page. Next slide, please. Well, I think, um, you know, I don't want to go too much on about this. Uh, I provide this kind of information about how you manage your risk, especially in the area of uh, managing corruption risk in emerging and developing markets. I'm very happy to talk to any of you about it separately. You can contact, next slide please, uh, and the slide after that. I think I've talked enough, you'll have some questions. But if you want to get in touch with me, there are my coordinates, as they say, and you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, I should say that I'm running a, a webinar on the topic of risk in emerging and developing markets outside of the uh, you, outside of the EU, so we may one day be outside of the EU. Um, 19th of September, I'll be at the 23rd of October World Trade Summit in London talking about these subjects. Um, and uh, I will be running a, a physical seminar in London on the 31st of October, which is called Turning Risk into Opportunity. Um, I also specialize on two countries. Uh, one of them is uh, Vietnam. And I'll be running a Vietnam seminar. I think it's on 5th of November, but I'm not sure if it's in the diary yet. And I also specialize on Russia, and that's a 30th of October seminar on Russia. That's it from me. Um, I think uh, there may be some questions for, for Paul and for me. Uh, shall we go into question time? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, a really good kind of business talk tour of some of the issues there. And yeah, for, in terms of those links and some of the uh, further courses which Brooke mentioned, we'll try and include those in the follow up messaging after the webinar. But yes, um, we're now going to go to questions. And uh, you can still ask questions using the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. So the first question I will ask, I'll put it to Paul first and then bring in Brooke. Uh, it comes from Andalusia and Andalusia asks, um, do you think the UK is ready to become a very close partner with uh, the, the ASEAN region or individual uh, ASEAN countries? And what will the role of government be with this? Uh, so Paul. Hello, Paul. Sorry, guys, for that. I had to uh, remember to unmute myself. Um, well, the UK is already 
a close partner with, with ASEAN. Um, you know, bilateral trade is around 38 billion sterling. Um, and I believe last year we did around 18 billion in exports into the Southeast Asia region. So still, and it is, you know, a very, very important uh, marketplace uh, for the UK. Um, they certainly like, uh, which, which neither Brooke or myself has, has mentioned going along in the presentation, that the, the UK, the British brand, uh, sits extremely well in, uh, in this part of the world. Um, so um, what is the role of government in this? Well, um, you know, we, we, we as, as UK ABC, uh, working alongside government in, in as much as the Department of International Trade and the FCOs are really pushing and raising the awareness of, of ASEAN and its opportunities and doing a tremendous amount of, of uh, roadshows and events to build that up. The government, as you as you may know, have have, have nominated uh, um, trade uh, commissioners, so Majesty's trade commissioners, and we have a dedicated one in the way of Natalie Black, uh, who is the trade commissioner for for Southeast Asia. Um, she was APAC Asia Pacific, uh, but uh, very very shortly there'll be a, a new trade commissioner announced for Australasia. So uh, again, it will give Natalie a, 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 a huge opportunity to, to really focus and concentrate on those ASEAN markets. Great, thank you, Paul. And Brooke, Brooke anything to add on that question? Uh, well, no, I thought that was a very thorough answer from Paul. Um, you know, I'd just say that a lot of the countries there have very close historic relations with the UK. Uh, Thailand in particular, I suppose Myanmar does as well because of um, their, their, their leader who was educated at Oxford University um, and who's brought a certain amount of British culture to the reformed reforming country. Um, Singapore, of course, uh, I mean, there are these traditional links. So it's not like we're going into a market that doesn't know the UK. Um, a lot of people from these markets, uh, Vietnam in particular, they're sending, they're, there's, there's a very nice government scheme uh, called the Chevening, Chevening Scholarships, where they send young Vietnamese to the UK for their master's degrees and uh, your graduate education. So there's a whole cadre of decision makers in Vietnam, in government circles and in leading businesses, com local companies who have had a British education. And I, I think that that is a, a very important point. There is this um, kind of legacy of close relations. Of course, that doesn't mean that the challenges aren't there. It's just that the bridge across into these markets is just that little bit easier. Uh, so I, I think it's a kind of broad answer. Uh, the government's very supportive, and uh, I'm, you know, again, I, I'm more involved in Vietnam than in any of the other countries at the moment. But I see the British business group in Vietnam being very active, uh, in, especially in Ho Chi Minh City, which is the commercial uh, center there. Um, I see the British ambassador. You're very keen to promote business, uh, a lot of interest uh, in trying to find those uh, synergies between British business and the business in each of the countries. And uh, one of the areas is clearly high tech. Um, uh, and for example, again, in Vietnam, and I think maybe in the Philippines, the high tech sector is booming. Um, and it's booming partly because people are trying to find some alternatives to China. Um, and, you know, this is a, a, an area where British companies can, can go in quite easily and find a lot of support, local goodwill and support from our British institutions, including, of course, uh, um, um, my fellow organisation here, the ASEAN Business Council. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Um, and we had a couple of questions from Richard around uh, customs and, and the region. The first one is, um, is a 
sorry. Uh, the first one was the single market of ASEAN. Is it origin based or can all goods within the region travel about irrespective? And Richard has also asked what kind of lengths of time uh, does it take for goods to clear clear customs? Um, Paul, do you have any advice on that or kind of where Richard could find more information? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information out there regarding um, shipping goods out to that part of the world and, and how long it will take to, to, to get through uh, particular ports. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are some free trade agreements between five of the top countries there um, where, there, where there's zero, zero goods. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's... Um, uh, Obviously, can be as as Brooke mentioned, some delays in in getting your goods into the market, um, and 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 really um, the uh, the best way that uh, that is handled uh, is by having a good partner, a good distributor, a good support organisation there in country to to handle that for you. There are, um, I think, um, a lot of courses, training courses given by the British Chambers of Commerce here in the UK about customs uh, going forward, about logistics, um, all the British Chambers of Commerce here are, 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 are delivering uh, international trade and operation procedures uh, to support companies who want to get into uh, not just ASEAN but uh, all export markets. Thank you, Paul. And that's, that's also something the Institute does as well. And um, at the end of the webinar, I'll come on to talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, Absolutely. We've, Forget, forgot uh, to mention you there, William. <laughs> no worries. I sort of squeeze that in. And um, a follow up question as well from Aaron, who's just checking Is there a free trade agreement at the moment between the EU and Singapore? Paul. Um, so this this is still being uh, negotiated. So there's not really any free uh, free trade agreement between um, Southeast Asia and the EU. Um, okay, this is still under discussion, and um, you know the, the the UK will also um, be starting discussions around a free trade agreement with Asia. Good, good. Um, and then two final questions. Uh, one is from Catherine who asks, what barriers do you commonly see for consulting services companies entering into business in the region? Paul. Um, so, so the, the UK is um, one of the largest exporters of services from the EU uh, to ASEAN. And uh, it's always difficult to track um, exports of services out of the UK for, for various reasons, because a lot of it is done online. But what we do know is that more than half of the UK exports and imports and services to and from Southeast Asia relating to Singapore. And, and Singapore is dominating uh, that supply of services. Um, but one of the more sustainable service exports to the region is education. And that uh, contributes significantly to, uh, to the UK set of soft power assets, might I say, in Southeast Asia. So, you know, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand ranked, um, and uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia really ranked up there as, as the top uh, regions for servicing education. Okay, thank you. And uh, the last question was from Nicholas, and he's asked, to what extent will the China Belt and Road Initiative um, affect the dominance of China in the region, and how could that itself affect UK exporters? Um, I don't know if, Paul, you want to start on that, and then open to Brooke for any further comment. So, Paul? Yeah, you know, uh, China, Korea, Japan are huge investors in the region. And uh, part and parcel of that is, is, is the infrastructure construction uh, region, and um, they do dominate that. But it's mainly from the foreign direct investment. It's not um, not um, always clear that uh, they will also uh, be dominating the, the consulting work and the actual 
building work. Um, what we've got to also be aware of is that, uh, yeah, they may be doing a, a big infrastructure project. There's a lot of, as we know, other sector opportunities coming off the back of, um, of, of those uh, infrastructure projects. And of course, the ASEAN governments have a good say in, in what and who supplies what into the region. So, albeit there might be big, huge China investment, it doesn't mean that China having the whole whole project and the whole supply. So, yes, there are opportunities there. Yeah, I think there are opportunities, and again, you know, there are quite a few risks. And I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, nobody's quite clear whether this is a kind of money-making exercise or, you know, a geopolitical grab for power by the Chinese. And um, it's absolutely clear that you know, there's no country in close proximity to China that can in any way resist Chinese money. Uh, and there are quite a few of the countries that are on this um, Belt and Road initiative, which is you know, the old Silk Road. Uh, on the whole, the Chinese focus is not necessarily to its immediate neighbors uh, in the south, in Southeast Asia and in ASEAN. It is looking westwards towards uh, the stands and then even going across to Africa. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that there are some, you know, huge white elephants. Uh, Sri Lanka is an example of uh, you know, this port that has been built with BRI money and which um, and has been no use and um, the Sri Lankans are finding that they have to, to pay it back. Essentially, the country is in, eternally in, to, in debt to the Chinese. So, you know, these, these things um, don't necessarily give China uh, a very, I mean, yeah, from, from a uh, sort of um, purchasing point of view, as it were, China is in a very strong position, being so huge and so powerful and so rich. Uh, from the point of view of actual goodwill and wanting people wanting to do business with China, I think you'll find that there's a coolness in the ASEAN countries. And that, I mean, again, the UK cannot compete with the size and power of China. It's obvious. But uh, we do have these old relationships. We have got a reputation for doing business in a clean way. And uh, I think you'll find that people would prefer, if all other things were equal, to do business with a UK company than with a Chinese company. So I, you know, I think there's some sort of emotional stuff in there uh, which cannot be properly uh, and fully uh, ascertained in, in value terms. Uh, or in, in, in uh, not numerical terms, shall we say, but in terms of what people might prefer to do and what they feel comfortable with, I think there is every opportunity for, for, for Britain, uh, even in a way to compete with China. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke, and also to Paul. And I think on that note, it's probably time for us to wrap up. Um, so, yeah, thank you both for speaking and for the answers. Next slide, please. Thank you. You're welcome. So in terms of what we have coming up at the Institute of Exports and International Trade, we are running several Brexit related training courses in the lead up to the October 31st deadline, many of which are fundable by government grants. I I'm sure you won't need reminding of the enormity of what is ahead, but you really do need to ensure you've got the core export skills covered, including completing customs declarations. So please do look at the funding available and the training section of, ex of the export.org.uk website. Some of you also know that the Inca Terms 2020 rule changes are on the way and we will be running a series of training courses in the autumn to help you stay up to date with these changes. I um, definitely recommend you have a look at those. And apprenticeships continue to be a great opportunity for businesses to upskill staff in extremely important global trade skills. Again, lots of opportunities there, which are all on the website. And finally, we launched a new UK Customs Academy recently, uh, which will provide professional custom support and uh, a, a pathway of qualifications to those who are new to international trade through to seasoned professionals. You can find out more information about that at ukcustomsacademy.co.uk. Next please. 
In terms of open to export, our next webinar will go into further depth about managing risk in emerging markets beyond the EU, again with Brooke and also this time with Bibi Financial Services too, and that is taking place on September 19th. We're also going to be shortly announcing a series of webinars to help you indeed prepare for Brexit at the start of October. Uh, please keep your eyes peeled for more information about all of that. And you can also uh, re-watch some of our Brexit webinars from early in the year, and you can find details about all of our upcoming and our previous webinars at opentoexport.com forward slash webinars. Next, please. Finally, we launched a uh, another export action plan competition with Bibi Financial Services at the start of August. This is a great opportunity for SMEs to win £3,000 towards their export plans. The deadline to enter is November 5th, ahead of a showcase final in, the, in Birmingham on November 28th. For more details about this, please go to opentoexport.com forward slash info forward slash export dash action dash plan dash competition. But that is all for today. As always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. But for now, thank you and goodbye.